about treaty making. To illustrate the diversity of perspectives, there are elders alive today who know not only about the text of the treaty, they know actually what happened in the ceremonies during treaty negotiation times. These elders know that what was said in the private discussions that our people had in their, in their private lodges in between negotiations, that's the extent that we still talk about treaty in the oral tradition. We go so far as to even recall the discussions that were happening in between the negotiations. The history of the treaty making process is well documented in the academic record and so is our history of the years following treaty. The history of treaty implementation thus far is a sad one and is characterized by the application of colonial policies and laws that have been meant to either exterminate us or assimilate us. The history of the residential school system for example is very well documented and the insidious intent behind its policy objective is now well known to many Canadians. Fewer people are aware that an equally insidious plan was developed and policies were implemented towards the extinguishment of self-determining self Indigenous communities. These policies have been shaped in various ways over time. One of the lesser known policies is the policy of termination that was described in the 1969 White Paper. What people don't know is that despite our apparent win by defeating the White Paper, the principles of the White Paper have been used in policy development. <clears throat> And these policies continue to be enforced today. Now let's just take one example here. Today I'd like to ask in the audience, how many of you have a, have a treaty card? Okay. All right. There's mine right there. That's what I used to look like. <laughs> now I'm, I'm going to tell you a bit of a truth that, that might be a little bit disappointing. But very few First Nations communities have actually developed a treaty card. The card that is given to you by the Department of Indian Affairs is not a treaty card. It is a card that identifies you as a status Indian. A status Indian is a person who meets the criteria of being called an Indian under the Indian Act. The Indian Act is a piece of colonial legislation that overstepped its boundaries long ago by allowing unlawful incursions into the original jurisdictions of our people. Being a status Indian allows your name to be entered into the Indian Register. Being a status Indian allows you the chance to access some of the very limited programs and services that are provided by Indian Affairs and Health Canada. I want to stress to you today that the limited programs and services that are provided to status Indians through the Indian Act are not your treaty rights. Many of our people over the past three generations have become wrongfully convinced that the status Indian cards we have today represent that we are treaty Indians. They wrongfully think that these cards represent our treaty relationship with the government of Canada. This is part of the illusion. These cards are part of the policy objective of the federal government of Canada to control how you understand your identity as an Indigenous person in Canada. What exists in and is fostered by Canada is a highly controlled and tightly managed identity crisis for treaty people. Canada has long controlled the acquisition of an Indian identity while simultaneously denying the freedoms that are created pursuant to treaty. Since the creation of the Indian Register in 1951 or so, the Canadian government has maintained a prescriptive process. The Canadian government decides who can call themselves an Indian and who can't. The creation of the Indian Register took over from the treaty annuity pay lists, thereby appropriating treaty identities and denying families or leadership from determining their own citizenship. The Indian Register program is fraught with problems, including applying historically racist policy, such as disqualifying persons from Indian status if their families took Métis scrip. In other instances, some people acquire Indian status while others from the same family are denied. The early administration of the Indian Register ignored the authority of the communities to determine who their families were under the new system. It was a cost management exercise. The administration of the Register began and continues to deny people access to the treaty annuity pay list, forever casting treaty rights and the Indian Act on divergent paths. Now for those communities who develop their own citizenship or membership codes, because there are many, Canada still controls who becomes a status Indian under the Indian Act. This means that although a community might decide who is going to be a member of their First Nation, 
Canada decides who is counted as a status Indian of that First Nations community for the purpose of managing program costs. If a person is named a band member under the First Nations own citizenship or membership law, Canada will not provide funding for programs or services for that person unless they're also a status Indian under the Indian Act. This is particularly problematic because the existence of the status Indian is expected to disappear in the not too far future. If the, trend if the trend remains the same as it is today, the status Indian will disappear, and so will the funding for the programs and services that goes with the status Indian identity. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not making this stuff up. This is all well vetted in the, uh, in the academic record and the research that's being done by our people. Now, how many of you have heard someone you care about say that they got their treaty rights back when they became a status Indian? Some people have spent millions of dollars to get their Indian status back through Canada's courts because they thought it meant they too got their treaty rights back. The truth be told, Canada is all too happy to have people tie up its courts for decades because it allows it to maintain the illusion that the benefit of treaty is tied to Indian status. I think it's high time we recognize that treaty rights and Indian Act are two entirely different things. Now, just a note on that. Uh, I'm here to tell you that the treaties exist outside of the Indian Act and the prescriptive identity that one acquires by becoming a status Indian. Now, this does not mean that one cannot be a status Indian and a treaty Indian at the same time. In fact, there are a great many people who are both status Indians and treaty Indians. But the distinction between the exercise of treaty rights and the exercise of access to programs and services under the Indian Act remains an enigma. Now, a unique opportunity surfaced in the 1980s with the advent of Section 35 of Canada's Constitution. It was an opportunity to address this, this growing problem, this growing identity crisis that Indigenous people face in the Canadian Constitution. Section 35 broadly defined Canada's Aboriginal people and included Indians, Métis and Inuit people. It also recognized and affirmed existing Aboriginal and treaty rights. To create greater certainty around what this all meant, there was a promise to have a series of constitutional conferences to address the many questions that arose from the wording of the new constitution. Great leaders of the time, which included many leaders who are still active today, were made aware of the commitment to have one of the constitutional meetings dedicated towards addressing Aboriginal issues. Because of the failures identified in the process, the meeting exclusively dedicated to Aboriginal issues did not happen. Great leaders like my friend, the late Jim Sinclair, converged on Ottawa to discuss the content of Section 35. These leaders very early on made an observation that the Constitution that was drafted for Canadians created barriers for Indigenous people instead of preserving our freedoms. It was due to the efforts of Jim Sinclair and others that entrenched the recognition and affirmation of existing Aboriginal treaty rights into the Constitution. As they knew that the inherent and treaty rights of our people are not individual rights, the leaders of the day kept the Aboriginal and Treaty Rights Clause out of the individual rights found in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I think that's a very important note that I would like to make. For all of us who are sitting here today thinking we have treaty rights, it's very important not to conceive of your treaty rights as mere entitlements, mere entitlements that are boiled down to a, to a human right or to a, to, a, to a right which might be defined under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The treaty rights are much more expansive and they include duties and responsibilities, not just entitlements. So when you apply for your funding through your community for post-secondary support as you pursue your education, that money that's coming to you is not, not just an entitlement, but you have duties and responsibilities owed to receiving that money. And for me, my exercise of responsibility meant that I go back to my community and I make contributions. I make contributions in recognition of that treaty right to education. And I think that's something that we, we don't pay enough attention to. Now, when I was younger, I went to, uh, I started out in university and I didn't do very good, you know, because I, I, I didn't really have the concept of what it was to, to, uh, to learn uh, effectively. You know, I felt that my, my check that was coming in every month from the band was my entitlement. It was my treaty right, that check. But I didn't really conceive of the fact that if I was going to be successful accessing the treaty right to education, I had to put it into a context in terms of how would I give back to the community? Where would I give back to the community? Because that's what allowed me to focus in on what I wanted to learn and what I needed to know. And after that, I became quite successful. <clears throat>
Now, one of the big challenges that came up during the constitutional discussions was the was the concept which we, which we now know is metaphorically categorized or characterized as an empty box. In the empty box theory, the content of the box would become the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights that were expressed in the text of the Constitution. Now this metaphor became very contentious for the leaders of the day. Some felt the box was already full of rights and others felt that each and every existing Aboriginal and treaty right had to be defined and then put into the box. And I really like that graphic, I thought that was a very well well, well done job there. The impasse created a, a dynamic in the Constitution that remains unaddressed. In many ways, the impasse that happened in the Constitutional Conferences of the 1980s represents a very considerable piece of unfinished business within the Constitution of Canada. In my opinion, since the perceived failures of the Constitutional discussions of the 1980s, the box has remained empty. Now with that said, First Nations people are certainly aware of a very broad and comprehensive set of freedoms that are associated with it being Indigenous people in our ancestral lands. These freedoms, however, do not exist in a bubble. Commitments must be made to reconcile the differences that continue to create deep divisions between the interests of the settler societies and our Indigenous freedoms. I believe that there is a new leadership emerging amongst First Nations people that's guided by the work and wisdom of our, of our elders and our former leadership. It's recognizing that we must be willing to put our laws on paper and to meet part way along the path towards reconciliation. I believe that we're in that process now. In the 30 years since the constitutional talks, hundreds of millions of dollars has been spent on litigation. This litigation has attempted to define what Aboriginal and treaty rights exist, thereby purporting to fill the section 35 box. This is problematic because the courts are not accessible for the vast majority of our people. And we're not protecting our rights by taking them into court and asking for them to be defined. In fact, the establishment of new legal precedent that pertains to Aboriginal or treaty rights, although may appear on the surface to establish new rights, rather serves to impose limits on our freedoms, the freedoms that we historically enjoyed. I've heard many times that we must protect the treaties and then we march off to court you know, and early in my political career, I thought I was doing the right thing when I took our freedoms into the courtroom. Today, I believe that once we walk into court, we've already lost the battle. The reason we lose the battle is because we lose the opportunity to exercise our political will and to negotiate the parameters of our freedoms. Freedom is not negotiated by First Nations that continue to possess their original jurisdiction that was never surrendered when we go into court. One of the other matters that I think remains outstanding, and I brought this to the forefront earlier, is that we are aware of who the status Indian is in the, in the Canadian Constitution. I showed you a picture of my status card. Now the status Indian is clearly defined in the Indian Act, which is created under the legitimate authority of Section 91 of Canada's Constitution, or the Federal Powers Arm of Canada's Constitution. What we do not know, however, is who the Indian is in the newly created Section 35 of the 1982 Constitution. That is a matter of unfinished business. The lack of political attention paid to the unfinished business of the 82 Constitutional Talks is a constant reminder to all First Nations people that our certainty in the constitutional landscape of Canada remains outstanding. In the 30 years that have passed since the, since the patriation of the Constitution, the identity of Canada's Indigenous people in a Canadian context remains unclear. An entire generation of young people has come of age with uncertainty as to whether we are part of the constitution of this land or not. And I'll admit that I am one of those people. I remain uncertain as to who I am and what my standing is in the Canadian constitution. And I think that's where my education took me. In, in pursuing certainty and identity of who I would be in a Canadian landscape, I only found greater uncertainty when I stumbled across the constitution and some of the earlier work done by some of our, some of our uh, our, our people. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not solutions, you know, and I think that's one of, the, one, of the, one of the difficulties when you come out of a learning environment and you're expected to perform and function. You know, one of the greatest difficulties in politics is to move beyond identifying the issues, which I think I've done in, in, in part of this presentation, and to actually move towards solutions. Since my election as Grand Chief, my foundational approach to leading the organization can be referred to as a rights-based approach. 
That is, before making a decision, I always consider the impact of that decision in light of obligations owed to maintain, preserve, protect and enhance the inherent and treaty rights of our people. The rights-based approach grows out of the original jurisdiction philosophy that I shared with you earlier, and it's fundamental to the way we do business today at the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. Our experts at the AMC work with me every day towards finding solutions for some of the biggest challenges facing our people through a concept known as the Unity Accord signed between the AMC, the Manitoba Kuwaitin Ogimakanak, the MKO, and the Southern Chiefs Organization, allows for our experts to come together to seek collaborative solutions. Between our, between our staff complements within the three organizations, we have PhDs, lawyers, and MBAs informing our processes and discussions. We have tremendous capacity within our First Nations organizations to develop solutions that would help advance you know, the Manitoba economy, but, but, but nationally as well. Two of the foundational pieces of work currently being developed by our staff at the AMC include what I call the resource equity position. And I believe that the treaties are synonymous with resource equity. My elders have told me that we will not be politically independent as long as we are economically dependent. That means that our political voice will continue to be controlled until we can move beyond the funding arrangements that we have with colonial governments. This initiative must be undertaken with the further understanding that First Nations governments do not want to operate their governments with taxpayer dollars. They want their share of the wealth and the resources from our ancestral lands. Now those words come specifically from my friend Elijah Harper. And I always try to make a note of recognizing him whenever I say that. To put the concept into a working process, we've developed the concept of resource equity as a solution to moving beyond the damaging effects of poverty and reliance on government funding. The resource equity position envisions a blueprint for First Nations people to engage with provincial and federal governments towards equitable resource development. Broadly speaking, there is room to negotiate a way through the natural resource transfer agreements in the Prairie Provinces towards a sharing of the income derived from resource development. The concept requires the establishment of a new commitment towards education and a new commitment towards a shared jurisdiction on resource management. Through a shared management regime, the treaties would be respected and processes to develop resource opportunities in mining, for example, and other industries could be built that take into consideration the inherent treaty rights of our people. Currently, the policy on consultation and accommodation coming out of the common law standards of the Canadian courts is, is falling woefully short of the standards expected by our people, and it's having a detrimental impact on, on economies across Canada. If there was a commitment to develop the resource equity solution, and an, an amendment to the Natural Resource Transfer Agreement could be brought forward without a constitutional amendment. And as we speak, I have people framing out the constitutional process and the blueprint for diplomacy and negotiation. But I'll also mention that thus far, the provincial government of Manitoba has rejected the idea of working together on this concept. Another one of the solutions that we're working on at the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs stems from a, a recent meeting we had with a, a fellow by the name of Stephen Harper. <laughs> In early 2012, uh, the Prime Minister and the National Chief of the AFN began talking about resetting the relationship between Canada's Indigenous people and the Government of Canada. The beginning of the solution was what was called a Crown First Nations Gathering. And I know some of you were there, because I was there too. I noted to the National Chief almost immediately that it was inappropriate to call the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister's meeting a Crown gathering because the Crown was absent from the table. And many of our people observed that the Prime Minister is a political actor of the day. He is not representative of the Crown in a Crown First Nation context. And we wanted to ensure that treaty people were respected in the discussion. So we pressured the Governor General. If the Queen couldn't be there, then the Governor General should be. And we got the Governor General to be at the, uh, at the gathering, thereby validating somewhat the name of the meeting. Now more importantly, however, was the opportunity to engage the concept of resetting the relationship. The AMC began discussing how best to reset the relationship and we arrived at a place that took us back to the constitutional conferences of the 1980s and the unfinished business of Section 35. When we converged in Ottawa to meet with the Prime Minister, we continued to pressure the government for a constitutional meeting to address First Nations issues. And that is the piece that we brought from, from the, the treaty regions of 
Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, you know, was the need to put all of the issues on the table, to have the right decision makers at the table, and that's not just the Prime Minister, but under the Constitution of 